Are we ready? Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm Deputy Speaker Diana Ayala, and we are here today to officially release the Council's Fiscal tw Year 24 Preliminary Budget Response. A budget is a statement of values, and the Council has been clear that what we value is the safety, health, and well-being of all New Yorkers. Our budget agenda reflects the priorities of our delivery legislative body and members who represent every corner of our city. The best way to help New Yorkers succeed is by investing in them. As the speaker eloquently said in her state of the city last month, we must put our people over everything. That will not be accomplished by failing to invest in essential services and programs that are a lifeline to communities. New Yorkers need fully funded libraries, equitable and well-resourced early childhood education programs, access to food assistance and housing vouchers, and a public school system that provides opportunities for every student. New Yorkers deserve a budget that meets their needs. As chair of the council's general welfare committee, I am particularly focused on providing stable housing for unhoused New Yorkers and ensuring that residents get their benefits processed and delivered on time. With the severe underst uh, understaffing at key city agencies, that is not happening. As a council, it is our job to point out the gaps and solutions from our different perspective. As you will hear from our speaker and our finance chair, our preliminary budget response calls for investing in essential services, housing, and educational opportunities that uplift New Yorkers across all five boroughs. As we continue to negotiate the city budget over the coming weeks, we will continue to stand up for equity, progress, and what is right for all New Yorkers. This is our charge to deliver the best budget for New Yorkers. Thank you, and now I'd like to introduce the leader of the New York City Council, Speaker Adrian Adams. Thank you so much, Deputy Speaker Ayala. And thank you all for joining us today. Before I begin, I would just like to express the council's condolences to the family and friends of the two construction workers who were uh, killed this morning in the tragedy at JFK Airport. Our hearts and prayers truly, truly go out to the families. Thank you once again for joining us today as we unveil the council's official response to the fiscal 2024 preliminary budget. Thank you once again to my right arm, my deputy speaker, Diana Ayala, for the introduction and for being our MC today. We, of course, have our finance chair, Justin Brannon, here, along with Majority Leader Keith Powers and Majority Whip Sylvina Brooks Powers, Council Members Gail Brewer, Rafael Salamanca, Sean Abreu, Carmen De La Rosa, Amanda Farias, Crystal Hudson, Rita Joseph, Shaker Krishnan, Linda Lee, Farrell Lewis, Julie Menon, Virina Sanchez, Natasha Williams, Julie Wan, who did I miss? Mercedes Narcisse, Lynn Schulman, Oswald Feliz, Sandra, Sandra Ong, <laughs> Eric Danowitz. Lynn I got, I, okay, got everybody, okay. And of course, we want to especially thank our hardworking BNT members and Council Finance Division staff for all of your hard work. Since the start of this year's city budget process, the Council has made clear that our vision for the city is one that focuses on putting people over everything and investing in the essential services that all New Yorkers rely on to be healthy, safe, and successful. Throughout the prelim preliminary budget hearings, we examined agency budgets to understand how they propose to address some of our city's greatest challenges, whether it's our housing crisis, food insecurity, public safety, education, and many other areas. We heard from service providers, city agencies, and everyday New Yorkers. The council's preliminary budget response is our guide for the direction of the city budget towards fulfilling the city's obligation to deliver essential services. We understand that the city faces potential budget and economic risks. For months, our city has been shouldering nearly the entire cost of providing services and support to thousands of people seeking asylum. The economy poses potential challenges of its own, while the state budget remains outstanding and carries its own uncertainties. 
Our budget response accounts for all of those risks, including costs related to labor settlements, which were not accounted for in the preliminary budget. We've worked with the administration to minimize our state budget risks by raising shared concerns regarding proposed MTA cost shifts, the low reimbursement rate for asylum seeker services, and other reimbursement formulas we believe shortchange our city on education and social services. Yet, despite all of this, there is an additional revenue that should be utilized to fulfill the essential needs of our city. Failing to adequately invest in our city and New Yorkers at a time when we're facing so many crises also carries immense risks. It could result in families going hungry, worsening mental health and housing crises, and other far-reaching consequences that impact our economy, health, and safety. Those are risks that we simply cannot afford. As elected officials, our responsibility is to our people. The council's budget response seeks to balance these potential risks and avoid the ones that are most likely to hurt everyday New Yorkers. I'm proud to say that our budget response is fiscally responsible and accountable to the people of our city. It identifies an additional $2.7 billion in potential resources through the end of FY 2024 that can be utilized. We designate over half of those resources for the reserves to account for potential risks that may arise. That leaves $1.3 billion for the city to invest in essential services identified in our budget response that were either cut in the mayor's prelim preliminary budget or the council envisioned as important for this very moment. This $2.7 billion is the product of council finances tax revenue project projections exceeding OMB's estimates by $2.4 billion in 2023 and $2.8 billion in 2024. And again, we account for covering the labor set settlements based on the pattern set by DC 37. To be clear, council finances revenue projections have been accurate largely resembling those of other financial entities that make projections like the IBO or the city and state comptrollers. On the other hand, OMB's estimates have typically diverged from others. The investments detailed in the council's budget response fall into four categories that are aligned with this council's priorities. The first is building stronger neighborhoods and opportunities which focuses on roughly $318 million towards affordable housing and housing supports for renters, NYCHA, and homeowners, as well as economic opportunities and neighborhood aid. We're making sure the programs and agencies responsible for housing have the resources they need to help New Yorkers secure affordable and safe homes. This includes calls for the mayor to include an additional $3.3 billion in the capital plan for affordable housing that he committed to, which helps us reach $4 billion per year, including for NYCHA. A reversal of cuts to NYCHA's operating budget, restoring the $33 million to the vacant unit readiness program taken out in the November plan, given the significant uptick in vacant NYCHA apartments that have skyrocketed from 490 in 2021 to over 3,300 in 2022. A major investment of nearly $58 million to expand supportive housing for people with justice system involvement as a way to reduce the jail population and recidivism by helping people successfully reenter communities with supportive services. The second is ensuring the delivery of essential city services, which is focused on getting our agencies that deliver critical services back on track and making sure we're supporting the services New Yorkers need. We are recommending $474.3 million to increase resources for right to counsel and public defenders, restore funding cuts to our libraries, cultural institutions, parks, and sanitation that were cut in the preliminary budget. Restore cuts to city FEPS housing vouchers. Expand food assistance at this time of heightened food insecurity. Deliver more accessibility for our older adults. 
and ensure the oversight agencies that investigate corruption and misconduct, like DOI, CCRB, the Board of Correction, and others, are adequately funded. Additionally, we must fix agency operations that are an obstacle to delivering essential services to New Yorkers. These problems are a function of the high number of vacancies we have in key agencies, which has led to housing and food insecurity due to delays in processing food stamp and housing voucher applications. We're working with the administration to address understaffing through co-sponsored hiring events across the city. We urge New Yorkers to attend these hiring halls and apply for the many jobs available at the city. To aid with recruitment, we will work to remove the barriers that stand in the way of agency hiring. And we will continue to advance pay parity in our municipal workforce, like EMS, and at the FDNY, which remains a priority for this council. We also have to make sure to resolve outstanding payments to city contracted nonprofit service providers, which continues to be a problem. To resolve the inefficiencies with agency operations, we have to invest and ensure budgeted funds are being released and utilized towards staff capacity where we need them most. Our third priority is to improve community health and safety, which is focused on access to health care. This includes a strategy to confront our mental health crisis, which we'll be rolling out with our mental health committee chair, Linda Lee, through a mental health roadmap. This council has been laser focused on effective community-based safety solutions that are too often overlooked because of narrow ideas about how to achieve public safety. These comprehensive investments are what the city needs to make for our collective safety, to address our mental health crisis, and to close Rikers Island. We know that people with mental health challenges are less safe when they don't receive the appropriate response and care and come into contact with the criminal justice system. As we continue to reiterate, Half of the people on Rikers Island have a mental health diagnosis, which has turned Rikers into a de facto mental health facility. Too many communities in our city still lack access to comprehensive health care. Health and safety go together, and investments that draw from evidence-based interventions are how we can stop crime and violence. We have identified $117 million in physical and mental health investments and safety solutions that we believe can help get our city on the right track. We're looking to invest in community-based violence prevention programs and enhance the first in-state trauma recovery centers we helped establish last year to help stop cycles of violence and support underserved crime victims in their recovery. We're calling for expanded investments in a series of community-based models that rely on mental health professionals and peers to meet people where they are. This approach, approach is most effective at averting and addressing a crisis before it worsens. And these include expanding crisis respite centers that are an alternative to hospitalization. Expansion of assertive community treatment, or ACT, ACT teams that provide case management to individuals, including those who have been involved in the justice system, and growing intensive mobile treatment teams that provide in-depth and continuous support and treatment to individuals in their own communities. To reduce recidivism, we call for increased investments in alternatives to incarceration that are proven to work, and an expansion of diversion programs so people with mental health challenges are getting the treatment they need instead of ending up in jail. Together with our supportive housing model, these are the kinds of investments we need to make to get back on track to closing Rikers so it no longer undermines safety in our city. We also want to expand school-based mental health clinics to support our students at 100 additional schools because we know mental health services among our young people are so needed right now. And we're also recommending that the executive budget include support for every h and hospital to have a reproductive health psychologist to support the mental health needs of parents during and after childbirth to address issues of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders like postpartum depression. The fourth priority is education. 
which I'll let our, our finance chair outline in addition to any numbers he may want to give you. I want to close with this important note. As stewards of the city's budget, our goal as a council is to pass a budget that accurately reflects our city's needs through a realistic and balanced financial plan. One that meets the needs of our city and New Yorkers. Fiscal responsibility means accounting for risks, but also investing to support the essential services that help the city and help our people to succeed. In service of all New Yorkers, the council is focused on building stronger neighborhoods and opportunities, ensuring delivery of essential city services, improving community health and safety, and safeguarding education and learning opportunities. The health, safety, and well-being of our city, our communities, and our economy are all bound to how well we deliver a budget that achieves these principles. As we continue with the budget process, we look forward to working together in the council with the administration, the partners outside of government, and all New Yorkers to move our city forward for everyone in it. Thank you. Let me introduce you. <laughs> oh my goodness. We want to hear, hear from our finance chair, Justin Brennan. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I, I want to again thank uh, the, everyone that works so hard behind the scenes, the entire finance team for all their long hours and hard work in, in getting this done right up until late last night. Um, and of course, all my colleagues on BNT, the budget negotiating team. Um, hardworking taxpayers measure the return on their investment through efi uh, efficient delivery of essential government services. More than simply an itemized list of income and expenditures, a budget is a moral manifest. That's why we believe sound fiscal stewardship means focusing budget priorities where they matter most. From maintaining funding to 3K, to restoring cuts and investing in CUNY, from expanding rental vouchers to clean streets, from funding libraries to filling potholes, everything in this budget response is something that the council believes is worth fighting for. The council remains laser focused on investing in opportunities for New Yorkers through economic and workforce supports and neighborhood reinforcements. Expanding fair fares to more New Yorkers at 200% of the federal poverty level. Creating a fire safety outreach and battery swap program for deliveristas in the aftermath of our recent legislation, legislative package in order to take dangerous batteries out of circulation and facilitate access to safer batteries. We're supporting workforce development programs for our city's MWBEs. We're prioritizing equitable investments in street safety infrastructure that have been lacking in so many outer borough communities like mine, where infrastructure investments have not kept pace with increased traffic violence. The council is calling on the administration to maintain 3K funding and convert seats to extended day and extended year. We want to provide pay parity for 3K and early childhood education providers. The council wants school budget transparency in order to protect student learning. We want to fully fund arts education in public schools and provide increased support for our community schools. As the council heads into another round of budget negotiations, we do so seeking partnership with the administration and with eyes wide open to the challenges on the horizon and at our doorstep. The council has never doubted the durability of our city's economy, but we know resilience doesn't happen on its own. It requires thoughtful, meaningful, and tangible investments. We have what we need to spend and save, and we must do both. New Yorkers don't run and hide. We stand and fight. The city's best days are ahead of us. You can count out New York City at your own peril. With a laser focus on equity and efficiency, the council can maintain public trust and truly build a city that works for everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> she meant that. Any on questions? <laughs> <laughs> scared. You took your job. Um, Speaker Adams, I did want to ask, I know that the main, I guess, disparity in terms of money, according to the report, is the tax 
revenue projection. Um, is that correct? And could you just explain a little bit further why there tends to be a disparity between the council's projections and then um, OMB's projections, and if you've kind of figured out why? Yeah, well, like I mentioned uh, in my remarks, there has usually been that difference. Um, we tend to be uh, a lot more optimistic when it comes to the city budget. OMB typically is more uh, conservative when it comes to the outlook of the city budget. On top of that also, we um, did find uh, other uh, funding, which we mentioned as well um, in our projection and taking a look at the bigger picture for the budget as well. So all things considered, uh, the council's projection, IBO's projection, the comptroller's projections, we believe that we've got the right picture as far as the fiscal responsibility is concerned. Since there has been, who, who, I guess who turns out to be right in that projection? Is there like a tally? Finance team, would you like to? <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, it is usually the council that tends to be correct. Speaker, um, what do you make of the mayor's threats that additional budget cuts are on the horizon? Um, especially as you just, as Katie just asked you, you have more money that you have found. But do you think that that's realistic, that more pegs could be on the horizon? You know, we're hearing that. We haven't seen anything yet, though. So until and unless we can see something tangible, something that we have to address concretely, we can't really give um, a statement to the hypothetical unless we have it in hand. But we have heard the same thing. And where, where have you heard that? I mean, of course, essential services, right? Fire, police. I haven't heard. Things? I haven't heard anything. I've just heard in the air that more pegs are coming. And that's pretty much all that I've heard. Sorry, one more question. The migrant crisis, the mayor has said a billion dollars this fiscal year, it's going to balloon to 4.2 in two years, right? Um, do you think any of the money that you guys have identified would go towards that, that need? Oh, absolutely. Um, we have definitely addressed the asylum seeker crisis for the city within this budget. Absolutely. Thank you. Speaker, you talked about the restoration of cuts to libraries, uh, Human Resources Administration. Can you give us an idea, is that like across the board for everything that the mayor is proposing cuts for? We uh, have to take a closer look at it, of course. We're still in deliberation. This is the kickoff uh, of the response. So we're going to take a look at the big picture. We know that um, these essential services should not be cut. Uh, our children look toward us, our elders look toward us to make sure that they do have safe spaces in our libraries and other places across the city. So that is this council's uh, opportunity and our intention to make those things right for the people. Where does um, the NYPD overtime budget fit into all this? And, and what do you want to see done with that moving forward? How should that situation be addressed? Thank you for that question. You know, there really is nothing uh, physically responsible about routinely exceeding a budget. Um, we have to rein it in when it comes to overtime in the NYPD, and we're going to continue to press the issue throughout the entire budget process. It's something that uh, the council agrees that we cannot um, let go ignored, and we will not. We will continue to press the issue. This does it require, as you know, the police union has said, hiring more cops or, you know, I know there's kind of a cost benefit with paying the OT and not taking on the benefits that, that you know, are paid um, over decades as opposed to, um, you know, not paying the OT, not paying so much OT. Like, what's kind of your sense on where the happy medium in that lies? It's going to have to be, quite frankly, a change in behavior. Uh, the behavior that's gone on now for a very, very long time. And we saw very clearly in our oversight hearings that this is a behavior that has continued year after year after year. It's incumbent of, uh, upon us now to help the agency rein that in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you talk about next steps when you actually get to the bargaining table with the mayor's of office? Course. Are you going to wait until executive comes out? Are you meeting with them now? Can you give us a sense of what's going on behind the scenes? Yeah, thank you, Joe, for that question. We are in ongoing meetings, of course, uh, with the administration. Uh, our finance teams are meeting uh, on a continuum, and we're going to continue to do so um, until we get to that happy place 
um, in getting the right budget for the people. So the meetings are ongoing. Um, I have no timeline for you as far as when uh, we do. Um, we would like to maintain the integrity, you know, of passing a budget in a timely fashion. And that's pretty much all I have for you for that one. Um, you know, the mayor talks about some of the same priorities he wants, you know, provide education, housing, public safety. Could you just talk a little bit about how your perspective differs from his? Like, why are you coming up with different priorities than him? I really can't answer that. I don't know um, what the thought process is. Um, I, what my belief is that the bottom line is, um, is that the money uh, for the administration and how the funds or uh, projected uh, lack of funding coming into the city is taking its place. Of course, the asylum seeker crisis um, has put an extraordinary burden on the entire city of New York, and that has played a tremendous role as well, I, I believe, in the budget process us also, particularly for the administration. Uh, we just happen to have, once again, a more optimistic outlook and forecast when it comes to our budgeting. Um, our finance unit has been doing this for a very, very long time. We have some of the best economists in the world, as far as I'm concerned, in doing this work behind the scenes for us. So I firmly believe, you know, in the work of this council and truly in our finance unit. Um, hi, Speaker. You have a section in the in the response document about finding efficiencies in tax expenditures and sort of taking a second look at, at old tax breaks that might not be effective anymore. I'm just wondering, is this sort of a new initiative that you're taking? Like, has the council made this demand in, in previous responses to take a, a closer look at those kinds of programs, or is this reflecting sort of a, a new approach? Well, I think that this is the first time that we're taking such a deep dive. Um, into this, it, it, um, it is not the first time that the council has taken a look, you know, um, at this notion when it comes to taxes and uh, and helping helping out uh, New Yorkers and the city uh, in fulfilling what we have to fulfill. So um, the answer is yes and no. It's not the first time that we've taken a look at this, but certainly um, the first time that we've taken this deep a dive into this because of necessity. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.